2024 total solar eclipse passed through Maine last Monday, April 8th, began at 328 in the afternoon and ended at 335, seven minutes. For this seven minutes, thousands of people came into the state of Maine to see this phenomenal event. Some of you remember Brad Shaw, um, served as an elder at the Church of Biddeford for a number of years, but Brad told us that, or he lives in Vermont, hotels usually go for a couple hundred dollars a night. They were charging $1,200, right? $1,200 a night, and they were getting it. Seven minutes. The Bangor Daily News had this byline, headline. By noon, an estimated crowd of 4,000 had shown up in downtown Holden, filling up most of the available parking. Holden has a population of 6,000 people. <laughs> the Kennebec Journal said more than 10,000 people flocked to Jackman to take in the total solar eclipse. Now, Jackman is up in the northwest corner Small little town, that's where Ganderbrook started, in <clears throat> Jackman. Small little town. 10,000 people flocked to Jackman to take in the total solar eclipse. Officials said money of the crowd was the biggest they had seen in the northern main town, which by mid-morning was packed with visitors ahead of the afternoon eclipse. New Center, Maine reported tens of thousands traveled to Maine to view the historic eclipse, an estimated 30,000 visitors entered Maine on Sunday, one day, through the York Tolls of the Maine Turnpike. 30,000 visitors in one day. So their estimates run anywhere from 30 to 40, 45,000. They're not sure how many people, because just in one day, 30,000 people. Amazing. Seven minutes. <laughs> The solar eclipse of April 8th, 2024, has become known as the Great North American Eclipse. Famous already. It was a total solar eclipse. It was visible across a band that covered parts of North America, from Mexico to Canada, and across the continental United States, or the mainland United States. This event, as we know, occurs when the moon passes between the earth and the sun. It obscures the light of the sun that blocks all direct sunlight. Totality occurs only in a limited path across the earth's surface, with a uh, partial solar eclipse being visible over a larger surrounding region. And that's what we had. We had a partial solar eclipse. I was driving through Kennebunk. I told Betty, I said, it's like watching a uh, sci-fi movie in progress. Everybody was out of their <laughs> houses, office buildings, they had these funny glasses on, and they're looking, people were sitting, people were standing, I mean, there was a lot of people out there. It's like, you know, looking for UFOs or something, it's just crazy. <clears throat> this eclipse was the first over the United States since August 21st, 2017. And it's the only solar eclipse in the 21st century with, total, with its totality visible from Canada, Mexico, and the United States. The next total solar eclipse in the United States will be on March 30th, 2033. And it'll pass over the state of Alaska, so we're going to miss that one. The next total eclipse in the continental United States will be on August 23rd, 2044. That's a ways off. So, what do people see in an eclipse? What's well, interesting to consider what those of years past have seen in an eclipse. Because there's quite a lot of folklore and several ancient myths that are associated with this event. In an effort to explain why the, the sun had suddenly disappeared, Superstitions abound. It's, interesting. it's an interesting study. The word from which we get eclipse literally means to fail. It's the Greek word eclipsis, 
and it's defined as an eclipse, an abandonment, literally a failing or a forsaking. To forsake a usual place, to fail to appear. Where's the sun? Where's the sun? It's gone. And this word appears in Luke 22, 32, when the Lord says to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. That your faith should not eclipse, eclipses, the Greek word. Many legends that attempt to explain an eclipse involve mythical characters or pagan gods. And these mythical characters or pagan gods in this folklore, they, they're attempting to eat the sun. That's how they're trying to explain it. In Vietnam, it was a giant frog that ate the sun. In Norse mythology, it was wolves who ate the sun. In China, it was a dragon. We would pretty much guess that. In Hindu mythology, the god Rahu swallows the sun and then spits it back out seven minutes later, however long the eclipse is. People from ancient cultures would gather together, they would make loud noises, they would bang pots and pans, um, <clears throat> they would shoot flaming arrows into the sky, and they'd do this during the solar eclipse because it was thought that this bold, chaotic action would scare the one who was, scare away the one who was stealing the sun. That's what they thought. In more recent superstitions, and many still see eclipses as evil omens, that bring death, destruction, and disaster. A popular misconception is that a solar eclipse can be a danger to pregnant women and their unborn children. This one's still around. Um, in many cultures today, young children, pregnant women, are asked to stay indoors during a solar eclipse. Many in Indi India still fast during a solar eclipse due to the belief that food cooked while an eclipse happens, will be impure and possibly poisonous. That's interesting. And in contrast to this, many Italians believe that flowers planted during the solar <laughs> eclipse are brighter and more colorful than flowers planted at any other time of the year. So superstitions and misconceptions regarding an eclipse abound. There are just so many of them. I, didn't include there's a whole pages and pages of them. So in our country and culture, most acknowledge and understand the scientific reason and the logical explanation for an, a solar eclipse. It is a simple but infrequent matter where the sun, moon, and the earth line up, and this temporary temporarily blocks the light of the sun. Eclipses of the past can be accurately traced and documented. And what is even more amazing is that they can be predicted hundreds of years into the future. How can this be? Because they are the fruit, they are the result of a well-ordered, God-ordained, universe. The precise and predictable operation of God's amazing design allows these extremely accurate calculations to be made. As the psalmist David rightly declares, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's Psalm 19, verse 1. So are there any references to eclipses in the Bible? Well, there are references to a darkened sun, and there are references to prolonged times of darkness during the daytime. But although liberal scholars and Bible skeptics often insist that these, that these are the unique instances that we're talking about are not the result of naturally occurring solar eclipses. So the liberal scholars and Bible skeptics will always try to say that these are natural, naturally occurring uh, phenomena. They will try to explain it in that way. 
The incidents recorded in God's Word are supernatural. These are divine acts of God. So let's take a look at a few of them this morning. The first is the sign of Hezekiah's healing. This is 2 Kings chapter 20, and I'm going to turn there. We talked a little bit about Hezekiah this morning. Later on, if you want to make a note, chapter 18 of 2 Kings talks about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the very few good kings of Judah. And he's sandwiched between two of the worst, the most evil kings there are. First, uh, the one he followed was his dad, Ahaz. And Ahaz was a very ungodly man. Uh, Ahaz brought in pagan worship. He closed down the temple. He boarded up the temple, got rid of the priesthood. Um, idolatry was rampant under his reign. When Hezekiah came in, he was only 25 years old. He reigned for 29 years. Hezekiah came in as king, and what he did, because he had a heart for God, he followed God. He obeyed God's commands. When he came in, he got rid of the pagan altars. He got rid of the, the pagan idols, the pagan temples. He eradicated them. And he restored the temple and temple worship according to God's commands. He restored the, the priesthood and brought people back to God. Uh, incredible for those 29 years. Sadly, he was followed by his, his son, who was also a bad king. So let's uh, pick up, let's, if you're in 2 Kings chapter 20, let's go ahead and start right at verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Well, that's not a good message, is it? You probably don't want Hezekiah wanted to hear. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. Here is Hezekiah's prayer. Verse 3, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle of the court, he hadn't even gotten all the way out yet, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will heal you. On the third day you should go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add, your days, uh, add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. So they took it and laid it on the boil, and he, Hezekiah, recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord would do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go backward ten degrees? Now what's being talked about here is the sundial. And the sun cast a, a shadow on the dial. And Isaiah is saying, Shall the shadow regress or progress? Shall it go backward or go forward? That's what's being talked about. And Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward ten degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had uh, gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. So this is, of course, a miraculous event. Now, it's been legitimately documented that on March 5th, 702 B.C., which was the 16th year before Hezekiah's death, a prominent solar eclipse appeared over the Middle East. Its path crossed the Arabian Peninsula, and the effect of obscuring the sun over Israel was more than 60%. Some suggest that this eclipse was the cause and occasion of the sign that was given to Hezekiah. 
But was this sign a naturally occurring solar eclipse? Well, of course, Almighty God can do whatever He wants. But the thrust of the passage that we just read reveals this divine sign to be miraculous, not natural. Time and time again, these liberal scholars and Bible skeptics see the need to try to provide some kind of natural explanation for supernatural events that God has clearly orchestrated apart from natural forces. The second one we're going to look at is the darkness that occurred during Jesus' <coughs> crucifixion. Matthew chapter 27 verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. This was a verified historical event that was based on eyewitness accounts and corroborated by a number of highly qualified ancient historians. The inspired word of God attests to the fact that it was completely dark from noon to three in the afternoon. And this is the first of several supernatural events that occurred when Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> now was this a naturally occurring eclipse like the one you and I witnessed last week? The answer is no. And for a few reasons. The Passover always fell on a full moon, and the eclipse during a full moon would have been impossible. A total solar eclipse takes place during the new moon. Also, the darkness of Jesus' crucifixion lasted for how long? Three hours. Three hours. According to NASA science, where I got this information, the longest period of darkness for a naturally occurring eclipse is 7 minutes, 29 seconds. That's the longest <coughs> that's ever been documented. During Jesus' crucifixion, the darkness lasted for three hours. It would appear from the text that the darkness covered a much larger area than would occur in a natural eclipse. The word land here can refer to a certain region or can refer to the whole earth. In fact, Luke's gospel <laughs> records the event this way. In Luke chapter 23, verse 44, it says, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Several interesting, interesting reports in extra-biblical literature also suggest that the darkness <clears throat> that existed at Jesus' crucifixion was worldwide. Origen talks about this and also Tertullian mentions this. So what was the meaning of this complete and prolonged darkness? The scriptures really don't provide us with an explanation, but we do know that this was a supernatural event, not a natural eclipse. Therefore, it was a divine sign created and orchestrated by God himself. <clears throat> the Jewish rabbis of the day, these Jewish rabbis would view any darkening of the sun as a depiction of God's judgment on the world for an especially heinous sin. And this sentiment certainly is applicable here at the Lord's crucifixion. In speaking of Assyria being used by God to punish Israel, the prophet Isaiah spoke of darkness and sorrow that would cover the land when the light is darkened by its clouds. That's Isaiah chapter 5, verse 30. And in describing the day of the Lord, the faithful prophet Isaiah declared, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. And he also said, the sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Thus saith the Lord, I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. Isaiah 13, verses 10 and 11. When Jesus was born, the night sky was made bright as the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds in the field. Luke chapter 2, verse 9. And Jesus was the light of men, the true light, which gives light to every man 
John chapter 1, verse 4, and again verse 9. Jesus spoke of himself as the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12. So it was appropriate then that at his death, the sun would be dimmed and the darkness would envelop the land. Thus saith the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. That's a prophecy from Amos chapter 8, verse 9. And then Jeremiah 15, 9 adds, Her sun has gone down while it was yet day. Some in the denominational world have interpreted this most recent eclipse as a sign from God that our nation should repent. My, my, my brother in Pennsylvania sent me a video about the end times and how this eclipse fits in and all this. I, I couldn't even get through it all. Um, one of the inherent problems with interpreting these astronomical events this way is how do you choose which eclipse is a message from God? Most calendar years have at least two eclipses. In some years, there are up to five eclipses. So how can we know what the eclipse signifies, what the actual <coughs> message is, and to whom the message is directed? Without a direct divine revelation or an inspired interpretation, we're simply left in the dark. And that pun was intended. What can we know about the eclipse, and what can we learn from it? It signifies and solidifies the irrefutable fact that the whole universe is in order. Scientists and astronomers can pinpoint <coughs> the exact path of the eclipse. Maps and charts are available to give precise details for the location of the eclipse, its time duration, and many other factors. And they can tell us with these astronomers and scientists can tell us with pinpoint accuracy when the next eclipse will occur, even though it's years away. How is it possible to predict something so many years in advance with such certainty? Well, it's because God created the vast and complex universe to operate flawlessly with intricate precision. That's God's creation. The biblical account of creation that's recorded in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 14 through 18, reads this way. <clears throat> then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. These celestial bodies that God created were for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Verse 14 tells us, this was God's intelligent design. To keep his creation, to keep the universe in perfect working symmetry, in perfect working order throughout the centuries. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And that's from Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. All things were created by him and for him, and by him or through him all things consist. That, is the word where we get our English word consistency. In other words, by his power, all things hold together. All things function and hold together. Without the power of God, it would all fall apart. There are many remarkable signs of intelligent design in our world and throughout the universe. 
The clockwork precision of all the stars and planets is only a small part of the incredible manifestation of God's almighty power in, that is so, shown so clearly and so plainly in everything that he has created. As the psalmist declares with great assurance, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. In other words, the creation bears witness to the Creator. And this is a message that a lot of our evolutionists can't seem to get. The creation bears witness to an intelligent Creator. And that's what these verses are signifying. As it was noted earlier, some think that the appearance of an eclipse is a sign from God to repent. But you know, we really don't need a sign from heaven to know that we need to repent. Because God now commands all men everywhere to repent. That's in Acts chapter 17, 11. So if you have unresolved sin in your life, if you have unrepented sin in your life, God calls you to repent and bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 3, verse 8. It's in Matthew also. He gives you this opportunity. God gives you this opportunity this morning to make things right with him if they're not already. And if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God into salvation, by being baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts 22, 16, God gives you opportunity to be baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. He gives you this opportunity to do that this morning. And if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If this is your need this morning, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, whatever your need, please come forward and make us know as we stand this